what I was saying is today we want to discuss quite a lot of quite a lot of interesting uh, concepts. We are wrapping up our discussion on discounted cash flow techniques, particularly uh, we are escalating from where we left. Remember last time we left on, on modified IRR value at risk and and NPV computations and stuff. And I gave your colleagues a task and I said, can you play the first video and be in a position to calculate value at risk? So as we are playing these two videos, the first two videos, clearly you, you, you actually catch up with your colleagues on where we are now. So what we want to discuss now is profitability index, uh, you know, that issue of capital rationing, and we kept it up, and then we discussed something to do with option pricing, the basic definitions involved in option pricing. That's what we want to discuss. So let us wrap up discounted cash flow techniques and introduce each ourselves to option pricing. Okay, so allow me as usual to open to open my uh, my Excel document here. Let me open my Excel document. All right. Um, I have I have sent to you all the materials that I have given your colleagues thus far. So I'm sure you have you have everything with you. Um, yeah, I just want to open my revision kit, which is BPP revision kit. You know, that's the revision kit that I like most, BPP kit. Though I, I equally like Kaplan, but, you know, as, as, as part of least resistance from experience is, I encourage you to use uh, BPP revision kit. Though Kaplan is equally good. I'm not downplaying it, but I'm just saying what I prefer. And it would make sense if you, as a student, you go by what your tutor prefer, prefers. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, so whilst these things are opening, allow me to open. Okay, so this is the question we're doing last in the in the last lecture. So allow me to open an Excel document to begin explaining the concepts for today. Uh, <clears throat> may take just a few seconds to open you know, these things. So could I, uh, what it means is you guys, this time you are my, you are my project and you 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 have to you have to pass because I remember last time you did entertain all the lectures right you joined the pathway in during the lecture right during the the, the semester so was is that so good well you can unmute and talk to your say if you want to talk to your say you unmute. All right. Okay. So today, let us discuss. Yeah. Oh, could I? You were saying something. You are agreeing with what I'm saying, right? Yes, I agree. It I was, agree, sir. Um, I, because I remember you joined way into the semester. So what I want this mm -hmm. time is, can we? Can you just? Make sure you play all the videos right from the start. We only had two videos. I've sent them to you, even to Tino. Just okay. play them. Uh, play them as if you are in the lecture. Don't allow anything to interrupt. So when you're playing the videos, the past videos, create the environment that you would have created for the actual lecture because that helps you in understanding the concepts discussed. And you then mitigate the risk of saying, perhaps this topic I wasn't there, this topic because you actually play it in an environment which mimics the actual lecture environment. And you know, ah, this time you pass it, never mind. Never mind. It's a very easy subject, AFM. That's the beauty of it. It's just quite a little bit, um, you, it's, 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 you know, 
it's 50 50 50 percent theory 50 percent workings don't you have the impression that afm is workings it's 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 in most people in some papers it's actually 55 percent theory and 45 percent workings so from experience i've i've realized that theory questions are a source of easy marks they are a source of easy marks so I will be emphasizing that on the go as we are teaching that this is how you get easy marks in a question like this, so that you, you, you maximize <clears throat> your performance in the actual exam. Okay, so capital rationing. These concepts you are concepts that you already know. Remember, I gave you the notes already. AFM notes by Mr. Mpats. If you don't have them, you let me know so that I send them to you. So what, what I'm doing here, it's not like I'm giving you notes afresh, no. What I'm doing here is explaining the notes I've already given you so that we can take each other through the entire thing. You know, those notes, I typed them myself. So I, without sounding egotistical, I am very jealous with them. I tried by all means to explain them in best language which I feel like if everything that you are using is giving you difficulties, try considering those as parts of least resistance. Okay, so capital rationing, you know, this is a concept that I'm sure you might have come across in your earlier modules. So capital rationing it describes a situation where the firm has insufficient finance to undertake projects with positive NPVs. So finance, is insufficient insufficient to undertake to undertake projects with positive npvs with positive npvs that's capital ration fm has got insufficient finance to undertake uh, to undertake projects with positive npvs right so you would notice there are various factors which can give rise to a situation where you don't have enough finance to undertake all projects which, which have positive NPVs. It arises from a variety of factors. But one of these factors, like like um, why shortage of finance, if you don't, if it, why shortage of finance, for example, shortage of finance, why do we come across a situation where finance is in short supply? You may ask this question. There are two main uh, uh, sources of or, or contributing factors to this. There is one which is called soft capital rationing. Soft capital rationing. Capital rationing. Now, can you you can make use of the chat feature and talk to me? What you understand by soft capital rationing? You can have, you can even unmute and talk to your say, or you can type in the chat. What's your understanding of soft capital rationing? Mm -hmm. Okay, Tino, we welcome you. Thanks for joining. So let me start by you, Tino. What what do you understand by soft capital rationing? Well, wow. Tina is not talking to a tutor. Rumpi, what's your understanding of soft capital rationing? Um, I think soft capital rationing is um, when the firm is uh, limited uh, finances due to internal factors, for example, the company police or maybe the management. Um, uh, does not allow or for the company to get uh, finances. There are internal limitations. Yes, yes, you are correct. So soft capital rationing, it's like funds are limited due to factors within the firm's control. Limitation due to factors within the firm's control. Limitation due to factors within the firm's control. That's soft capital rationing. And these are like, you know, like 
management lacking skills to run huge projects, management lacking skills to run huge projects, to run huge projects. It's a source of soft capital rationing or, or a fixing capital expend, maximum capital expenditure budget, fixing maximum maximum capex budget like what Umbe said say due to Kanban policy or something to say companies may actually say we don't want to exceed this particular uh, capital expenditure for this particular year and if the board uh, signs a budget of that magnitude it means our expansion or projects that we can undertake are limited to that now there's hard capital rationing where and capital rationing where finance is limited due to external factors and capital rationing. You know, in, in ad capital rationing, we are saying finance is limited due to external factors. And what might be these external factors? External factors may include issues like liquidity crisis in the economy, liquidity crisis in the economy. You know, when it's, it's like the factors are outside the company's control, so to speak. If if we can't get loans, if we can't navigate our 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 our, our investment terrain to our advantage, we, we we are exposed to hard capital rationing issues to to do with political and instability, political instability leading to investor flight. flight leading to investor investor flight is a situation which is called investor flight investor flight is where the economy in general is not conducive for people to commit for investors to commit their funds and it, it crowds out investors due to various uh, conditions obtaining in the economy one of them might be political instability legal uncertainty the investor friendliness of an economy can actually expose the company to not to have access to capital you get that so you may say how do you navigate how do you mitigate the the capital rationing situation you know you can the practical next steps if you find yourself in a situation where you have hard capital rationing. You know, you can lease an asset. Leasing might be a, a way where you enter into an agreement. You know, leasing is a way of circumventing capital requirement. You can lease it. But remember, leasing might be this might be to your disadvantage. So there's an evaluation which has to be made. And we used it to call these lease versus buy, you know, decisions. We have to carry out these to assess whether leasing is to our disadvantage or not. And and you can use venture capitalist. You can use venture capital, where you 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 you. But venture capital is 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 very expensive, but might be available provided what you are doing is promising. Because venture capitalists are risky, uh, you know, are risky taking firms who invest in small but struggling companies, promising but struggling companies, so to speak. So you can as well do that, or you can make use of Islamic financial products, Islamic financial products. So we shall be discussing this. These are ways you can rid yourself of hard capital rationing situation. So we expect you to know what I'm saying here. Uh, or if you don't, we shall take you through at, at appropriate time in the in our in our study. So whenever there is capital rationing whenever you find yourself in a capital rationing situation optimum project mix optimum project mix you know by optimum project mix i mean the best possible combination of projects which po which projects can you undertake now in, in when you are facing a capital rationing situation the project that you can now undertake are determined using either you know you, you, you can use either profitability index. That's that's number one. The approach you can take is profitability index. Profitability index. 
profitability index packet pi so pi is the commonly used approach to determine the the best possible combination of projects in a capital rationing situation what does pi really measure pi it, it simply measures npv per dollar of capital invested pi is it just equals to npv per dollar per dollar of capital invested of capital invested that's pi npv per dollar of capital invested so by 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 computation it's it's calculated as npv over initial outlay npv over initial outlay by initial outlay we mean initial cost or the investment for the project so if you say npv over the investment for the project you get you get the 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 the, 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 the profitability index so ordinarily, the higher the PI, the more profitable. The higher the PI, the higher the PI, the um, the PI comma, the more profitable the project is. The more profitable the project is. You understand this? So you rank projects based on PI. And 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 if you have forgotten this, we we asked you, we examined this when you're doing F9, which is a junior course. It's a junior subject to advanced financial performance. I mean, ad advanced financial management because F9 is financial management, and this one is advanced financial management. So when you're doing the financial management, we we examined the issue of of, of profitability index. I'm sure this is it's quite a very, very examinable concept there. At a FM level, you may just comment, I really do we ask you really to calculate it, but because not because it's not important, because we assume you know it. So that's it. So you know, profitability index assumes a, a single period capital rationing. Assumes a single period, it assumes a single period capital rationing capital rationing in which projects are divisible in which projects are divisible that's profitability index it assumes a single period capital rationing in which projects are divisible now your the, the obvious question might be say tell us really what you mean by single period capital rationing so single period implies that projects are to start at the same time single period implies that projects are to start at the same time at, at the same time same period so to speak not like time per se but period but though by period i mean time not as in clock but the same year so if we say all our projects are to start in year zero meaning now if you've got five projects, you want to know which ones to do because your finance is limited. You can calculate PI and rank them. The project with the highest PI is then undertaken first and so forth until you exhaust the available finance. But the, the use of PI is, pre, is predicated on the project uh, being undertaken at the same period. We call that single period capital rationing. That's number one. And number two, the project being divisible. Meaning, as you are allocating the available fin financing and you come to a situation where the balance of the funds available is not enough for the for, for, to, to finance a project, you can undertake that project uh, by, you know, by, by, by in proportion to the funds available. You can take a fraction of a project should you not have enough funding for it? You get that? That's PI. Now you may say, what if now projects are to start at different times? You know, there are instances when projects are to start at different times. In this case, they are not to start uh, all at once, but in different times. How then do you, how then do you come up with an optimum project mix under the circumstances? You you use what is called linear programming so let me let me let me again proceed with my illustrations here now if projects 
are to start oh sorry uh, if projects are to start you know in different different times times comma the optimum uh, the optimum mix the optimum project mix project mix is determined is determined is determined using linear programming linear programming you still remember linear programming now this li this linear programming is not necessarily the linear programming you're doing in performance management subjects where you would plot you would do quite a lot of funny funny stuff to to carry out the linear programming procedure and you'd notice the li the linear programming we used to do in performance management we were to use scarce materials to produce two products it was either product a product b so that you would plot a diagram, I mean, a, a, with vertical axis for another pro, pro, product and horizontal axis for another product. This time, this is not the linear programming we are talking about because you might have five projects. Now, if you do have five projects, you can't have a diagram where you've got a vertical and horizontal for five projects. This linear programming is, is with the, there is a computer software which helps us in doing that. It it, 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 it it carries out linear programming or queuing theory for you to determine the optimum utilization of projects. I mean, the optimum combination of projects in light of capital constraints. So steps involved in linear programming is like this. So you know that at, at what point do we use linear programming? It's when projects are to start at different times. Always know that they are not starting a... We, 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 are not, they, we are not just having this particular project, all the projects in, in year zero, no, but some in year zero, another in year one, or two in year zero, one in year one, three in year two, something like that. We call that linear programming. So, uh, and, and the special term given to projects, you know, which are starting in different times, is called multi-period multi linear programming. Um, multi period uh, capital ration multi period capital multi period capital rationing so what is multi period capital rationing the projects are to start at different times and we call this multi period capital rationing so whenever you come across that know for sure that the optimum pro project mix is to be determined using linear programming and these are these are the steps involved in linear programming steps involved in linear programming steps involved in linear programming all right so just let me just check the message no as you say um okay steps involved in linear programming number one Step one is define project variables. Define variables, so to speak. It's, it's like the same steps that we used to have with our two project product model in performance management or costing, where we were saying, how, how do we best utilize labor, which is ensure supply, materials ensure supply. The first task was to define variables. In the same way, that's what we do here. We define variables. For example, for example, you can say, let example. Uh, so you can say let, let um, you can say let x x one x one b project project uh, a b project a x two x two project b uh, b uh, you know you can continue doing the same until you get to a situation where you say x n b project 
project the whatever the last project that we have so that's what you do by def definition of variables so that's what you do first and then what you do next is step number two is determine the objective function determine the objective function when you are carrying out linear programming you have to determine the objective function Normally, the objective function is to maximize contribution from the available project. Uh, normally, uh, we need we need maximize NPV. Sorry, to maximize to maximize NPV from the available projects. Notice, uh, I was I was now saying available. I was now saying to maximize contribution because I'm used to linear programming in costing or performance management. But here we are in finance management. So what we want to maximize is actually net present value from available projects. You you do remember when you were doing when you were doing performance management, you would say contribution, which is C equals two project, two products A, B. And you'll be told that product product A is a contribution of 10, product B is a contribution of 5. So you'd say P is contribution equals 10A plus 5B. That's what you would do, because that will be your objective function. So in the same way, we want to, to maximize objective function on NPV for these available projects. Now, the projects... We have now denoted them as x1, x2, xn. So it will be like NPV equals, in the same vein, NPV equals. So you would say uh, dollar sign one, uh, dollar, dollar sign times, let's say dollar sign x1, x1 plus dollar sign x2 plus uh, dash 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 dollar sign xn what are we doing here we are we are, we are simply saying in as much as for product the ten dollars was contribution for a five was contribution for b but this time the dollar sign represents contribution from each project project where I mean, we represent NPV from each project, where dollar is the NPV from each project. So there you go. That's the dollar there. It is the NPV from each project. Now, step number three. This is a linear programming model. This is a linear programming model. You want to find the best combination of projects when finance is in short supply. So step number one, you define variables. Step number two, you determine the objective function, which is to maximize NPV from the available project. Step number three is now to formulate constraint equations from the from formulate capital constraint equations for each year. Formulate capital constraint equations equation for each year you then have to formulate the capital constraint equations for each year because capital is a constraint meaning it's a fixed figure for each year so you can have say example um example let's say year one constraint year one constraint year one constraint so year one constraint you may say um you know you may say dollar sign one x one x one plus dollar sign two x two plus dash 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 dollar sign n x x n x n then you say less than or equal to 
you'll be given the the file the funds which which are available less than or equal to something less than or equal to something and then so that's what you do you equally do the same for year two year two etc so where in this case where a dollar sign this dollar sign one and dollar sign two is the capital required for project one and two capital required for project one for project x1 and x2 x2 respectively respectively so that's step that's step number three and then you come to step number four you know when you're doing pm you would then plot a diagram but remember, plotting a diagram was uh, was convenient because back then you used it to have two project, two products. Like another one is product X, another one is product Y. But this time, plotting a diagram it's not ideal because you have more than two projects, up to project N, which might be six, seven, ten projects. So what you do then? You use a, you key in if there is a linear programming software, and we expect you to know not to know the software per se, but to know how the how it works because exam questions are asked on the topic. So you would say you would input or to key in input the objective function and constraint equations. Input the objective function and constraint equations constraint equations into into a computer software keep, keep input the objective function and constraint constraint equations into a computer software to a computer software this is a linear programming software not any software linear programming software uh, so what does it then uh, do is after you have done this the the software will produce what is called a linear programming output for management decision making okay. the software then produces the software then produces a linear programming output a linear programming output for management decision making management decision making right um you may you may now say say what is this output you are talking about you know whenever you key in stuff in a software even at your workplaces, remember you use Pastel, you use SAP, you use computer softwares. And you know that when you key in information, when you capture information into a software, what a software does is it produces output reports. This may be in the form of a trial balance so that you can now produce financial statements. Or this might be in the form of profit or loss. This might be in the form of statement of financial position so you that's how softwares operate you key in stuff and it displays reports for you to make a decision or to take appropriate next steps so in the in the same way the linear programming software also works like that it it it, it displays the it then displays the the output table the programming output for you as a manager now to know okay so these are the projects which we can take and the extent to which we can take is there any unutilized capital for each year and stuff so let me give you an example just, this is just an example of how a linear programming output may look like so a linear let me say example of a linear programming output example of a linear programming output a outputs so this, this 
this might be the linear programming output. So what you do, it, it, it can give you in various categories in as much as your pastel can say expenses are these, assets are these, etc. Linear programming output can as well do the same. So it can give you like say category one, it may, it may reference it as category one or something. It may say category one and then say final value final value so it may say final value is two three comma eight million what does this mean what does this final value mean which is the category category one a uh, output so final value this is the let me write it here and say this is the maximum npv achievable in light of capital constraints this is maximum NPV achievable in light of capital constraints, in light of capital constraints. So that's the final value. So you go there. So after you have captured everything, that's what it tells you. Then it may give you another category and say category two, like what? Pastel does it may say revenue, expenses, assets, these are just categories. So it may give you category two. Category two, it may be adjusted or adjustable final values. Adjustable final values. Now it by adjustable final values, it may say it may say x1. 0, 0, 0,9 0, 0,9 then x2 you say 1 then x3 these are projects remember x3 it may say 0 and x4 suppose you had all these projects that you have captured in your in your pro programming software so what are these adjustable final values? You know, this one now, it is telling you the extent to which the projects can now be undertaken. That's, that's the meaning of adjustable final values. It's, uh, this is to which projects can now be undertaken, to which projects the extent to which projects can now be undertaken can now be undertaken that's adjustable final values in this particular instance like x1 is undertaken undertaken 90% uh, so X1, we have to take to do it 90% with X4, X4, 40%, X4 being undertaken, being uh, scaled down, X4 being scaled down or divisible to the tune of 40%, divisible to the tune of 40 percent that's that's x4 then x2 is undertake ah uh, x2 is undertaken in full x2 is done in full in full and and x3 not to be undertaken not to be not to be undertaken So you have that. This is adjustable final value. It might be another category in the output report. Another category might be category three, select variable. Category three. Category three, which is about select variable. All right. So, you know, Category three, which talks about slack variable. So in this particular category, what will be what what we might be just talking about here is the utilized capital. So you may say 
ये वन स्लेक ये वन स्लेक प्लस ए जीरो ये टू स्लेक ये टू स्लेक zero you get that this is now slack variables so what does slack category mean this this mean this category this category gives any unutilized capital for each year unutilized unutilized capital for each year it gives any unutilized capital for each year so so that's the slack category under normal circumstances if projects are divisible there will be zero slack for each year because whatever the capital which is left can be can we can undertake a fraction of the project with that capital but if projects are not divisible meaning they cannot be scaled downwards if projects are not divisible it is it is customary for you to find the slack with unused capital because if by by indivisible project we are saying suppose a project needs 100000 and you are left with 80000 you can't undertake a fraction of it so you might then find a slack meaning unutilized capital but if projects are divisible the slack categories they normally have zero zero amounts meaning if the available capital for each year is well utilized so this is basically the linear programming it is used when projects are to start in different periods we call this multi-period capital rationing what do we really mean when say projects are to start in different periods we actually say if investment is required different periods if we are to put it loosely that way by saying projects are to start in different periods, we are actually saying investment is being required in different periods. One in year, in year zero, another in year two, another in year three, and so forth. So if we have that, and in, in, in each of those years, still finance is in short supply. So yeah, you are experiencing a multi-period capital rationing situation. All right. So, let us open our exam kit. You know, the reason, I don't want you to get to the exam without finishing this kit. Don't even, don't even be, don't even do that. These questions are questions which are so, so important. Remember last time we did this, uh, the other time, this is question on value at risk. So this is a question that you can now, you can now work, work out. Actually, I want to give you this is, 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 is an assignment here. Yeah. I want you to, yeah. I'm sure if I give you TISA company, it will actually make a lot of sense. I give you this and then there's nothing much. It's an element of just calculating. Uh, all right. Oh well, it still it is still requires us first to do. It is still requires us first to do what we call cost of capital first. Uh, for you to 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 discount the project cash flows, because it's saying estimate cost of capital. So this is the chapter. This is the next topic that we are doing after option pricing. So you we 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 wait until then. So here. It's a ball company. If we can have this, if we can read along. Remember, it's in the revision kit. I'm just going down the revision kit. That's the that's the way to go. You may say, say, what is it that is required for me to practice? Once we do a question, just go to the revision kit and do questions. Once we are done with the topic, go to the questions on the revision kit and let us do questions therein on the topic. <clears throat> Abo Company is a large listed company with many autonomous departments operating as investment centers. It sets out investment limits for each department based on a three-year cycle. So it sets out 
investment limits for each department based on a three-year cycle. The fact that it's a three-year cycle, ability index in this case, because this is not a single period capital rationing, it's a multi-period capital rationing. Projects selected by departments would have to fall within the investment limits for each of the three years. The department would be required to maintain a capital investment monitoring system and report their findings annually to our board campus board of directors. You know what? This is, this is basically what happens. When you are undertaking projects, a project needs to be monitored. You need to understand that. You don't do projects without a monitoring mechanism. Projects require monitoring. It's so important. Why monitoring? You know everything that we do. Don't we know that it requires monitoring? What are the features of an ideal monitoring system for projects? You need to ensure that before we undertake a project, it is consistent with our mission and vision. In other words, a project should be a means for us as a company to achieve our mission. So if all projects we do should be in sync with our mission that we have set to achieve for ourselves. That's a monitoring requirement, number one. Number two, monitoring system must ensure that the project's expenditure for the project is approved by the board. When you are talking of long-term investment spending as a finance director, make sure that it is approved by the entire board of directors. This is so important. No wonder why in our casual or in our, in our interactions, we normally say this is above board. This wasn't above board. It's a monitoring, it's a control mechanism that we have put in place to monitor projects. Above board, this was approved, this wasn't ETC. Another requirement is when you implement the project, you must put in place mechanisms for time years a feedback, time as control mechanisms, like cost variance reports, revenue, checking the projected revenues vis-a-vis uh, -vis -vis the actual revenues you are getting, whether are we in track or off track, checking external environment, because these projects may last for six years and they are COVID lockdowns into year three. You need to check the external environment to say that if circumstances as they change, do they really warrant us to continue with the project or must do something? No wonder why a board company requires departments to report to the board annually about monitoring of this particular project. And then at the end of the project, don't just say we are done with the project, you know, you have to carry out what is called post-project audit or post-project review. What are the post-project audit or review? It, 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 it helps us as project team or as board of directors to understand the mistakes that we have encountered during this project and to make sure that the next steps are to, if we are to undertake additional project, we are not going to repeat the same mistakes. Also, the need for monitoring is to ensure that we, we do monitoring to ensure that we future projects are to be implemented in some other ways. Monitoring is also done perhaps, we, it can tell us in advance whether to abandon the project. You know, there are certain projects which we have to abandon should circumstances turn out to, to, to be worse than what we had anticipated. You had thought you would have a four-year project, you know, execute with, with, with marvelous or ideal executing conditions only to be told that during two years into the cycle, there, there are changes in laws and regulations and you are forced and the project is no longer profitable. Under the circumstances, what do I do? I have to abandon it. And how do I, how am I alerted of the need to abandon prior to completion? Because I do have an ideal monitoring system, an ideal monitoring mechanism for my project. So what, in, in, in conclusion to this part, what then forms an ideal monitoring, an ideal system for monitoring projects? How can you culture such a system, embed it in your investment appraisal procedures? Number one, 
make sure the projects undertaken by the firm are in sync with the firm's mission and vision. You know, aligning the project with mission helps to garner board support. It helps to garner the support of board members because normally directors are there to achieve mission and vision of the organization. So aligning long-term projects to the same is ideal to garner commitment from those who are charged with governance. Another point is all projects, expenditure for the project must be approved by the board. That one should not be overemphasized. Otherwise, you as an accountant will be left in the open to dry if circumstances go bad. They will say these were the ones who produced the funds. You, everyone will, will, will wash their hands and put everything on your shoulder. So this, it's important to ensure that all projects are approved by the board of directors. They are above board, so to speak. And then make sure that there is a concurrent monitoring system to get concurrent feedback on the goal. You know, as you are, are executing the project, don't wait for errors to compound. Put in place mechanism for coordination and control concurrently as you are executing the project. So that one is so important. And finally, carry out a post-project review to have the overall picture of how successful you were with the project. Were there any errors? Do you need to repeat this project? Suppose it outperformed your your, your expectations, it was marvelous. So do you have to repeat this project and and so forth? You have to have all that with you uh, at the end of the project. If you had made errors, how best can we now learn from these mistakes and avoid implementing these same errors as we execute next projects? So that's monitoring system. So no wonder why, as I was reading here, they are saying a bow company they are saying all departments would be required to maintain a capital investment monitor, a monitoring system. That's a capital investment monitoring system that I have alluded to just now. Now, you know, so it's like these departments, they, they, they are given expenditure limits for three years in terms of capital projects, making it a multi-period capital rationing situation. And now we have this particular pro uh, department, which is the DEVO department. Now, the DEVO department is considering the following five investments with three years of initial investment followed by several years of positive cash flows. So that's the DEVO department. Uh, the department's initial investment expenditure limits are, uh, are 9, 9 million, 6 million, and 5 million for year one, two, three, respectively. None of the projects can be deferred, but all projects can be scaled down, but not scaled up. What they are simply saying is they are divisible. That's a scaling. Scalability of something is the extent to which is it divisible or not. <laughs> Okay, you know, are, are you not seeing this? There's something which is called scaled up, scaled up. I always, I always tell when, when, when we teach you AFM, like we teach you ACC and you are done, you need to, you know what? These are, these are gossips we do in class with your say. When you are done with ACCA, make sure the earnings that you get are scalable. Always. Always try by all means as a, as a qualified person to ensure that your means of incomes are scalable. What do, what, what do I mean by that? They can vary at your individual or voluntary, your voluntary effort can vary what you earn. It's called scalable. Oh, well, sorry. You say I'm a growth consultant as well, so I have to tell you this. When I see these words, they are so important. I want you to like them. You will remember this. You will remember this. I know you can be a permanent employee on a, on a single job, but no, don't necessarily that, let that define what you earn. We teach you all this for you to internalize. No wonder why I'm explaining these words. These are not just exam words. You need to know. Investment required at the start of a year. So there's project, uh, project 
devil one, devil two, de so these are devil projects. They're saying devil department, so they're just denoted D, D for devil. Okay, just, just a sec, allow me to just check something I'll be back, I'll be back shortly. All right. So guys, I'm back. So continuing. So you can tell here that these are capital expenditure limits for each year. So all these amounts here, they are saying investment required. So all these are outflows. And they are saying year one immediately. So if they say year one immediately, they mean year zero. So it what it means is, if they say year one immediately, it's year zero. So year two, year three, then this becomes year one and year two. You get that? If they say capital is required at the beginning of year two, it means year one. At the beginning of year three, it means year two for cash flow timing purposes. Beginning of year three is end of year two. Beginning of year two is end of year one. So for cash flow timing, where it's written year one, we shall be putting year zero because of immediately. Where it's written year two, we shall be putting year one. Where it's written year three, we shall be putting year two. So NPV for all other projects has already been calculated. What is not given is for project. What what's not given is for project. Uh, it's for project. Uh, um, what's not given is for project five. And then let me proceed. Project 5's annual cash flow, operating cash flows commence at the end of year 4 and last for a period of 15 years. The project generates annual sales of the project generates annual sales of 300,000 units at a selling price of $14 per unit and in case total annual costs of 3230. Although the costs and units sold uh, of the project can be predicted with a fair degree of certainty there's considerable uncertainty about the unit selling price. The department uses a, a required rate of return of 11% for its projects, with infl uh, and inflation can be ignored. Devo department's managing director is of the opinion that all projects which return a positive NPV should be accepted, and does not understand the reasons why a ball company imposes capital rationing on its departments. Furthermore, she is not sure why maintaining a capital investment monitoring system could be beneficial to the company. Right, required. Calculate NPV for project day five and 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 calculate and comment on the what on what percentage for in selling price should need to occur. Okay before NPV falls to zero. Another is explain the strengths and weaknesses of NPV as a basis of making investment decisions in a capital rationing situation. 
B, formulate an appropriate capital rationing model based on the above investment limits that maximizes NPV for department devil. Finding a solution for the model is not required. Then, C, assume the following output is produced when a capital rationing model in part B is solved. In other words, what you have adjusted, what you have put in part B here. So in part B, when they are saying formulate, we shall, we shall formulate it together. But I said it's a linear programming model. Are you noticing the examiner doesn't tell you to say it's a linear programming model? The examiner says appropriate capital rationing model because the examiner knows that you know by appropriate, what do we mean? If it's a multi-period capital rationing, by appropriate, it's linear programming model. That's what they are talking about. So you have to tell the examiner what's an appropriate thing there. And then you have to comment on what, what are the figures produced in each output category, five marks. So these are easy marks because the software then produces the output, uh, output table and then for your management decision making. So provide a brief response to the managing director's opinion by explaining why a board may want to impose capital rationing on, on its department. Now, we, we have told you why capital rationing. Why is it we may deliberately impose, meaning, meaning soft capital rationing? It's like the head office is putting capital expenditure limits on departments. So this is a soft capital rationing situation. Why is it we may have soft capital rationing? Why is it we may limit deliberately the amount of funds available within the company? Why is it we, can, we may do that deliberately? Number one, we may do that because we may do that because we, 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 we know our managers may lack enough skills to undertake huge projects. Take, for example, you, in, in, in this particular group, we all want to do projects, you know, but you may notice you may limit the amount of invest, uh, projects that you may undertake. Why is that so? Because you may not have skills. If we give you a billion dollar project, you may, not, you may lack the requisite skills to run it. So uh, the head office may impose capital rationing, meaning may impose expenditure limits because the departmental managers may lack the requisite skills to run the project. You get that? That's soft capital rationing. And then D2 says, explain the features of, an invest, of a capital investment monitoring system and discuss the benefits of man maintaining such a system. I have told you the features. I have said, an, an ideal capital investment monitoring system requires that all projects being undertaken by the departments and by the company should be consistent with the firm's mission and vision. In other words, should be means to an end to achieve this particular vision that we have set for ourselves. Another issue here is the expenditure for the project must be, must be authorized by the board. Because these are departments which are running this project distributed all over the show, we must ensure that whatever they spend as capital pro in investment project, they have to obtain board approval first. Another is a concurrent system of immediate feedback, monitoring and control of costs and revenues for the project should be implemented. And the benefit of this is that it provides immediate feedback and time as corrective action, whether to abandon the project or even to expand it whilst we are actually running it. We abandon if circumstances turn out to be worse during the project, or we may expand it if circumstances turn out to be better than we expect. We don't need to wait until the end for us to decide to expand. We, how do we then get this time years feedback is to have a concurrent mechanism of monitoring and control. And lastly, at the end of the project, we must take out a post-project audit. And the benefits of such, it, it lets us to know whether to expand or to, uh, to replace this project or to expand even to learn from the mistakes that we have encountered. So 
Now, one may ask and say, say, why is it we notice the from even last topic, last chapter, that whenever you see theory, you go for it? Yes. That's, that's your say. It's, you know, I, I really, I really go for easy marks. Because I know that I need to be a qualified person. And I know that examiners are so generous enough when they see me trying to scramble wherever I can get easy marks. I hammer those down before I calculate NPV. Can you imagine this part alone of just saying, why do we have soft capital ration, two marks, and what are the features of a monitoring system, four marks? And explain what the, these output categories mean, five marks. This already is 11 marks. I can I can I can actually scramble eleven marks here. Notice what are the features in the output categories? What does that mean? Tell me, even without reading a question. Suppose the examiner is saying the invigilator is saying 10 minutes to go. I can actually get these six marks or even seven or even eleven. I can I can salvage eight marks if even in ten minutes to go. Now, suppose the examiner is saying, the invigilator is saying 10 minutes to go. What do you understand by figures in category one? Can you unmute and talk to me, Tino? You know, there is, I, I now have two Tinos. There is Tino Pisirai and there is Tino Kadaka. So when I say Tino, anyone can, can unmute. Anyone, when you want to say to, to talk to your say, you can unmute and talk to your say. So, I'm asking, what does cut? What are the what 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 really is the meaning of the figures in category one? Unmute and talk to me. Talk to your say. Yes, Kuda. You can unmute and talk to your say. I was to say, I didn't get your question. May you please repeat right. Talk to me. I'm waiting. Oh, okay. And my question was, in a question like this, go for easy marks. And there is part number C, which is saying, a linear programming output was produced. And then the question to that part is saying, explain the figures produced in each of the three output categories. So my question was, Okay, what can you explain on category one? What does that mean? Total final value, what does that mean to you? Yes, are you, are you, are you hearing me? Okay, Rumbi, do you want to, uh, Tino, you want to try? Okay, go ahead. Hmm. Rumbi, do you want to try? You can go ahead. So I think total final value uh, that figure represents um, the maximum net present value that we can get from the projects uh, in light of the constraints which are available. Yes. Total final value is the maximum NPV achievable from this particular project, given that funds are in short supply. So you can still hang in there, Umbi. What, what, how can you explain category number two? So category number two, I think this is uh, the extent that we can go around the projects available. That is project uh, one, the 
about uh, 90, 95.8% that we can carry out on that uh, project. Yes. So ca category number two gives us, you know, given that money is in short supply or funding, category number two then gives us the extent to which we can now undertake the project in light of those capital constraints. Like project number one can be undertaken 95,8% of what we originally thought. Project number two, 40,7%. Project number four, not at all. And project number five to be undertaken in full. Can you imagine just explaining like this? You are actually taking your five marks here. These are easy marks. So category number three, which are constraints. No, this category gives us any unutilized capital. That's slack. It gives us any unutilized, is there any unutilized capital? So in this case, the all capital for each of the three years was fully utilized. It will be, will be fully ut utilized as evidenced by slack being zero, zero, zero. Mm -hmm. All right. So these are the Max, notice, uh, so these are the categories. Category number three is about slack. Any unutilized capital, you can see here, this is the slack uh, category. So there's nothing, there's no unutilized capital. But my point was, easy max. Learn to go for easy max in an exam. These are easy max. Suppose you are told that there is 10 minutes to go and you want to start by calculating NPV. Imagine. This question, example, in which letter is telling you that 10 minutes to go and you want to start by calculating NPV with just the six marks. But there are these easy marks where you can even answer without even referring to the case. You and you take your 11 marks, and then the examiner is now saying three minutes to go. You can then come to explain the strengths and weaknesses of NPV as a basis of making. Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm hearing some echoes here. Allow me to meet you, Tino. Right. So, he's saying, explain, explain the strengths and weaknesses of NPV as a basis for making investment decisions in a capital rationing situation. You know, NPV, NPV has got some strengths. Uh, suppose we do have project A, we have project A and we have got project B. And then these projects, they cost, A cost 1,000, B cost uh, 500 and then you have got NPV. NPV for project A665, NPV for project B, for example, uh, NPV it's 475. Now, if we are told that there is no shortage of, of money or there's no funding gap, meaning the, the, you have enough fun, enough finance to undertake all these projects. If you are told that particular statement, you would undertake them because both have a positive NPV. But suppose, suppose the examiner then says finance is limited to just finance is limited to just one thousand five hundred. Ah, uh, finance is limited to, let's say finance is limited to eight hundred. Oh, uh, let, let me put it as 1.2. Projects, then do you have to undertake? You know, if you are using NPV, NPV doesn't solve this particular puzzle better. Because NPV will still say, go for a project with a higher positive NPV. So NPV would always say, if, 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 if you are going to use NPV as a decision criteria, it says, go for a project with a higher positive NPV first. So the 1,200 available, you would utilize 1,000 on project A and 200 on project B. But this might be a weakness. This might not be an ideal scenario. 
what you need to do now is you calculate profitability index to, to rectify that. Now, profitability index, you say NPV over cost to get NPV per dollar. So you can say, you can see now that uh, if we go by profitability index, project A is giving 66 cents per dollar, whereas project B, though it has got a lower NPV, but is giving us 95 cents per dollar. So what is an ideal intelligent thing to do? How best can you utilize the 1,200 available? If you want to better utilize the 1,200 available, you would rather undertake project B twice. You may even undertake project B twice, even without going for project A. But this can only be made apparent when you are using a profitability index. But if you are using NPV, NPV has got a weakness in that it doesn't bring, it doesn't bring that out. So this is the question which the examiner is saying, saying, explain the strengths and weaknesses of NPV as a basis of making investment decisions. So you would say, NPV measures the value created by the project based on present value of cash flows. Ordinarily, NPV is ideal if you are making decisions on mutually exclusive projects or even independent projects. As long as projects have positive NPVs, they should be undertaken. However, the scenario changes when there is capital rationing situation, when funds are in short supply. NPV does not address that because NPV still advocates for management to go for a project with a higher NPV. Yet, if we express this NPV per dollar, in other words, by calculating profitability index, we may come up, we can, we can arrive at a different conclusion. So NPV does not work best if if I if 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 the project is if the firm is insufficient sub, uh, finance. Another weakness of NPV is that it assumes that all projects are to start today. Remember, NPV stands for net present value. It stands for today's value, so to speak. So it's like the overriding assumption is that project every project is to start today. But remember, if you don't have money or if you are in a capital rationing situation, you may delay the project. Isn't it so? You, the project needs 1,000 or 20,000, but you still have 15,000. NPV assumes that you are to do it now, no matter what. In practice, if I don't have money, what do I do? I delay the project and say, look, I will start my project next year. I can delay it by a year. NPV does not acknowledge the delaying aspect of a project. You get it? So these are the weakness of, of NPV when you want to undertake projects in a capital rationing situation. It doesn't acknowledge that you can delay until you've got the money or you can invest in year three instead of year one. Get that? Now, continue. Or oh, you may say, say, why is it you are all, you have almost answered the question without even calculating? That marks me out as your say. It has been a blessing from God that as your say, I am laser focused. Could I, I am laser focused on easy marks, Rumbi. And you should copy me in that respect. I can actually get out of the exam having passed this question without calculating anything. That's your say. So can you imagine, already my marks are now in the 16, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Already my marks are now in the 16 mark category. Now in the 16 mark category, I have got 11 marks there. Here, I have already taken my 11 marks. I come here. I take my five marks. I'm already on the 16 mark category. So if the examiner is saying 20 minutes to go, I may even utilize this time to go to the next question, knowing perfectly well that this one I've passed it. With even without working. That AFM for you, don't even think of working and, and, and characterize it like that. No. You can as well pass if you know how to go for easy marks. So I will be training you 
And whenever I read a question, you will notice, as you say, I jump to the easy marks, get them first, and then do the math later. So like in this case, calculate NPV for project dev and calculate and comment on what percentage sell and selling price need to occur for NPV to be zero. Okay, so, so if you want, there are two ways for you to calculate NPV for project five. Um, but to, let us let us do it together here. Yeah? Let us do the basic way. NPV for project dev. NPV for project day five. NPV for project day five. Let us work it work 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 it work work it out together, guys. You 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 you, you can see here we have got. We do have information is is saying project day five annual cash flows commence at the end of year four, end of year four, and last for fifteen years. So in other words, it's for year, from year four to nineteen. If they start end of year four and last for fifteen years, so that's four to nineteen. You get that. And then, and then um, it generates sales of three hundred thousand and the selling price of fourteen dollars per unit, and in case relevant costs of thirty to thirty per year. The cost of capital is eleven percent. We are given that, so we can we can as well say yeah, nicely, yeah. Yeah, then you say zero, one, two, three, and then four to nineteen. Four to nineteen because they are saying end of year four and then through to through to for fifteen years. So it's year four to nineteen. Oh well. Four to nineteen. You know this this cell right year four to nineteen. What's the egg with this cell, guys? Let's see four to nineteen. Makes sense now. Okay, so there you go. This is an element of just reading the basic English from the from, by the examiner there. Uh, it will be convenient if we put our figures in thousands of dollars. It will be convenient if we put our figures in thousands of dollars. Okay. Copy. So there you go. So you have got sales, right? You have got sales. Sales is eight is three hundred units. It's three hundred thousand. So I'm just putting a three hundred multiplied by fourteen. That's the sales. It will start in year four, so equals three in, in end of year four times fourteen. There you go. And then annual costs. I'm given is thirty two thirty. Let me check three million two hundred and thirty. So annual cost is thirty two thirty. Right. Annual cost is thirty to thirty. Now notice, I want you to understand what 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 is meant by present value. Present value means today's value. So if you have a cash flow in year one and you calculate present value, it means value as of today. So if I open, let me open my tables. Let me briefly open the tables so that I can get. A question paper. All right. Okay, so okay, so what what you come to and 
to because this is from year four to year 19 so this is an annuity so you can actually have it you can you can have the net net annual cash flow like this is an annuity you can have it like this there so i have 970 it's my net annual cash flow now because this is from year four to year 19 it means if i discount it i get pv in year three so i can i can then say annuity annuity pv of annuity at 11 percent pv of annuity at 11 percent notice i come to my annuity tables here you will notice these annuity tables they do they don't go beyond year 15. they just go from year one to year 15. they don't go beyond year 15 but this time we need nine up to year 19. so we come to 11 percent and we take 15 like this because it's going to last for 15 years so we take 15. after which is seven which is zero seven comma one nine one seven comma one nine one now i want you to notice something this is a 15 year annuity but it's starting in year four meaning if it, if it was starting in year one it was going to give me present value in year zero let me repeat this is a 15 year annuity starting in year four so it gives me present value in year three if it was a cash flow starting in year one suppose it was saying an annuity from year one going forward it would have given me value in year but because this is starting in year four so it, it give me pv pv end of year three why end of year three because it's 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 a, this annuity is starting in year four so it doesn't give me a, a it doesn't give me value in year zero. It, it should make sense to you because notice annuity tables they start from year one to onwards year one onwards but if you then take an annuity for 15 years for a cash flow which is not starting in year one but starting in year four it means it gives you present value in year three because if 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 the cash flow had started in year one present value was to be near zero agreed on that if the cash flow was where was to start in year one and you discount with this annuity it means the pv was going to be near zero but if you use this annuity for a cash flow which is not starting in year one but in year four it means the pv is in year three because if it was in year one starting in year one we, we are going to get pv year zero meaning year before so if it's starting year four PV year three. Then, after doing this, you then say initial cost for investment. What is the investment required for project DEFO? Five, two point five, one point two, and one point four. So I come here and put investment because in it's minus two five hundred minus one two hundred minus one four hundred these are the investments and then i rediscount these investments at i then rediscount these investments so there you go i can just put do it like this i then uh, uh, so i can say net cash flow in the interest of net Net cash flow. Uh, let's say, yeah, just add this up. That's my net cash flow there. Uh, drag it through to year three like this, and then discounting factor is present value interest factor at eleven percent. You know, you can you can use tables to get discounting factors, or you can simply say equals one comma one one to the power, which is shift six minus n, which is your year. You can still get your 
your answers like that to three decimal places, All right? And then I, if I do this, I then get my PV, PV. So the question is, what is NPV for project? So I'm saying, please time. All right, so there you go. All right, so this is, these are my PVs, and then I say NPV equals NPV sum PVs, which is so I say equals sum equals sum. There you go. So that's NPV for project for project day five. So there I go. So, but it was the question again said determine the expected determine the expected uh, fall in uh, it's saying <clears throat> okay. Let me get to the question. He's saying, uh, calculate, co calculate and comment on what percentage for in selling price would need to okay before NPV falls to zero. So you now have the NPV. So there you go. So if I can copy it, perhaps, if I can copy it for me to show you something, copy here. And let me paste it here. Now, this one, which I've pasted, allow me then to shade it, say, in yellow. Now, for NPV to be zero, for NPV to be zero, you need to understand something here. This figure here, if for you to get zero NPV, let us work, let us work from bottom. Let us do it step by step and say for NPV zero comma this the uh, the PVs PVs of cash inflow. For you to get zero on the on this particular line, here instead of five point one, it must it it must be the sum of the outflow for you to get zero. Instead of having five point one here, it must be equal to the sum of these outflows. So PV of outflows it must be equal to it must be equal to two point five plus one. 0.8, 1, 0, 8 plus 1136,27 and then you say equals so it must be equals to then say equals minus sum so it must be equal to this it has to be 4 Seven one seven. If you put four seven one seven here, you must get NPV of zero. So because of that, we are now working in inverse. So we are now saying this is equals to this. And let us. Oh, sorry, undo. We are now working in inverse and say this is equal to this. So we let us now bold the figures that we are working. We are we want to find what the selling price should be for NPV to be zero. Remember, for you to get 675, for you to get um, 675, you said, I, I mean, if, if you want to come from 675 back to 970, if you say 970 times this, you get 675, times this, you get this. So 970, times this you get 675 times 0 0.37 you get 4, 4, 4717 so 
for NPV to be zero, we want to find a figure which we should replace 970, which if you multiply it, it should get us to 4717. So we are now working in inverse and say net annual cash flow, net annual cash flow must be, so net annual cash flow must be, you then say, uh, four seven one seven comma set five. We want to work four seven one seven to find the figure which should replace nine seven nine seventy. So divided by open bracket zero comma seven thirty one times we are working backwards seven comma one nine one. Let us see what figure must be. So equals this divided by open bracket this times this we are working backwards so 897 so instead of having 970 here we should get 897 so this is what we must get if you, if you put 897 here npv becomes zero you can see here. 897 times this equals this this times this equals this, and your NPV becomes zero. But the question was, selling price should be what? So you now say, therefore, revised selling price, revised selling price equals, you then say open bracket. Oh, you are now saying 300 units times, it's 300 units times SP minus variable cost 3230 must give you 897, 897. So selling price, if you solve this equation, you find that selling price equals SP cost, you simply say equals 897 equals open bracket, 897 plus that's a simple equation now if 3230 goes to the other side it becomes a plus plus 3230 close bracket divide by 300 so the revised selling price is 13 comma 76 13 comma 76 so this is the new selling price if selling selling price is currently 14 dollars if it falls by just 24 cents to 13,76, NPV would be, would be zero. So you then say percentage decrease in selling price equals percentage decrease P equals, you then say 14 minus 13,76 close bracket over 14. So you get it by saying equals Open bracket 14 minus this bracket over 14. And you give the answer as a percentage. So you find that the percentage dec decrease in selling price is 1,74%. If the selling price decreases by 1,74%, NPV for this project will be zero. So how, if, how is it that we found it? We, work, we just put the figures and then worked backwards to find the revised selling price. So if you put a selling price here of, if you put here a selling price of 13,76, if you want to now to verify 13,76, let us verify if NPV will be zero. So that one, uh, we, we do it like this. And then you multiply, you multiply this by this. And if you then find NPV like this, it will be it, it's coming out as four dollars thirty three because of rounding off, but actually it's zero. That's 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 the answer there. Okay, now notice, notice you are my wonderful colleagues, and I should tell you the approach to take in the exam. If you noticed this approach of going for easy marks, it liberates your mind. Imagine a situation where 
you were interrogating your mind this far because of just six months here. Perhaps this this way he's saying comment and calculate, it's it's like it's like uh, it's, it might be just the two marks. You, you calculate NPV, you get four marks, and that issue of comment and calculate might be just two marks. But I want you to notice something. Suppose you started with this question. You will, you know, buzz your mind with something which doesn't carry meaningful marks. No wonder why in an exam room, I want you to go for easy marks first. Easy marks first. And then Notice you were com you were already comfortably sitting at 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 sixteen mark category without any working, and then if you now have time, that's why I want you to do what we are doing here because I need you to finish the exam. So I will be teaching. I don't have enough time to teach and practice, so I teach and practice the exam at the same time as if it's there tomorrow. I teach as if you are writing the exam tomorrow, so it's so important. To, to say, why is it say it's now emphasizing as if the exam is there tomorrow? That's the approach taken. By playing the video, it should be a package of exam practice and lectures at the same time. All right, so uh, the next question is, the next question is, formulate an appropriate capital rationing model based on the above investment limits that maximizes NPV for project devil. Finding a solution is not required. You know, the examiner is, is saying finding a solution is not required. You know, this statement may or may not be written. Because I told you that in a, in a multi-period capital rationing, linear programming is not done manually, but it's done by a software. No wonder why we have that statement which is saying finding a solution is not required. Because it's done with a software. So when you're answering question number B, you would say you would say B and C because the the statement says appropriate capital rationing model. So you'd come to question B and say you'd come to question B and say um, since this since investment is required investment is Limited in, or I mean, over a three year period, over a three year period, period, comma, optimum project mix, optimum project mix, optimum project, optimum project mix, and using linear programming mind using linear programming so this is statement you have to say it to say because finance is not required at once but it's required over a three year period we determine optimum uh, project mix using linear programming because the examiner it said appropriate so you have to tell the examiner which one is appropriate so it's saying formulate, meaning you need to understand how linear programming goes because it's saying formulate. Now, because we have done it before, I'm going to copy there and paste. I'm going to copy everything and paste and then we add it together. There are four steps involved, but the, uh, the last step where the computer software produces an output, an output report, that one is done by a computer software. So what you do is when you're answering this we need first three steps it's just three marks so in, in other words the first three steps are enough one mark on each step one mark on each step one mark on each step so uh oh sorry copy okay let me come here And paste, let me paste it here like this. So, first step is define variables. In this, in this case, you are no longer saying let x1 be project devil, uh, be project a. You are simply saying let x1 be project p01, 
like this because they are given the, the actual and and then x2 b p day 0 2 p day 0 2 and then dash 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 you don't say xn now you say x5 because you know uh, there are five projects p day 0 0 5 now you may say say eh, do I, I eh, do I get marks from saying dash 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 yes you get marks remember you're just searching you're chasing one mark instead of saying define variables you don't say you you say definition of variables you no longer say define as if you want the examiner to define you are the one now defining so you say definition of variables Step number two is saying determine objective function because you are now writing an exam. You say objective function. Don't say determine as if you want the examiner to determine it. So you say objective function. Then we say normally we want to maximize NPV from the available projects. So that's what we want to do. So you simply say maximize, uh, need to maximize NPV from the available projects. So you now have your NPV equals, but remember we were saying dollar sign X1. This time you don't say dollar sign X1 because the NPVs are given. So you come here and say 464X1 like this. You come here and instead of putting dollar sign, you say 464X1, 464X1 plus a uh, for project two, 244, 244 x2 plus you have, I mean, uh, you, you can say dash, 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 this is still allowed, dash, dash, dash. Now for project x5, we have already, we, we, we have just calculated NPV for x5, it's 383. So you say plus, uh, you come here and say, plus uh, instead of dollar sign you say 383x5 that's step number two then uh, step number the last step says formulate capital constraint equations for each year capital constraint equations for each year you don't say formulate you just say capital constraint equations for each year because you are now answering if you say formulate, it would appear as if you want the examiner to formulate. So you now have a year one constraint. We said X1, dollar sign one, X1, and these were capital requirements for year one. So this, you are now given the capital requirements. It's 4,000, 8,000, 3 point, I mean 4,800,000, 3,200,000, 3,900,000, 2.5. This is X1. And the maximum available is 9 million. So what I simply do here is I come here and say, instead of saying, I now, it's dollar sign, I now say 4,000, because I now have the figures, plus project two requires 800, I put 800, plus project five requires, I put 500, uh, I mean, two, I put 2.5, sorry, 2.5, oh, that one is actually 4,000, not 400. Here I put 2.5. This should be less than or equal to, you can just say equals, equals a maximum available is 9,000. So I can as well do year two constraint. I can as well do year two constraint and so forth. I say year, year two, year two constraint, year two constraint. Now, the year two constraint here is the capital requirements are 1.1. I'm taking under year two, 1.1, 2.8, dash, 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 1.2. So it's a matter of copying, if I can copy this and then edit, copy this and then edit it here to, uh, to minimize my typing space, speed. The first one is 1.1, the other one is 2.8 the second one is 
2.8 and then the last one is dash 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 the last one is 1.2 i'll come here and put 1.2 less than or equal to i check less than or equal to what to 6 million so i put 6000 because my figures are in thousands then I, 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 I do the same for year three constraint. You now know what I'm talking about. So if this was just one mark per each step, one mark here. Uh, uh, for definition of variables, one mark. Objective function, another mark. Constraint equations, another mark. So that's where your three marks are coming from. It's easy. And then after you do this, I said you then input these constrained equations and the objective function in a linear programming software. And the linear programming software will then come up with what is called a programming output. A programming output then, uh, you know, the linear programming output then is the, is, is enables you now to, 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 to make decisions. So this is the output table. And what are these categories? Category one, total final value, maximum NPV achievable. Category two, adjustable final values, the extent to which you can now undertake the projects in light of capital constraints, e.g. project four cannot be undertaken, project five in full, project one, 95.8%. Slack category means any unutilized capital, like in this case, there was no unutilized capital for each of the three years. And you are done. And you are done. Um, okay. So, so today, today I wanted us as I as I have alluded to, as I have alluded to, I, I actually I I wanted us also to discuss option pricing. But realizing what you have learned today, I may end up actually confusing you. So I don't want to run the risk where after having done something so marvelous, I pollute it with 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 something that is not that is that that is not cool for you. So allow me then to defer option pricing to next week. Don't worry, I have to, don't say say we will we'll be able to finish. We'll finish we we'll, we we'll have the entire month of August for revision. Ask your colleagues who wrote in June. We had the entire month of May for revision. So don't worry. The beauty of it all is nowadays we have got some of the videos ready. So if we realize that suppose in this particular week we are a topic behind, we just send a video for that topic and we we'll play catch up with another topic on the actual day of the lecture. So that's the beauty of learning online. All these are my videos. I I have them. So there's nothing to worry about. So I don't want to dilute your understanding, even your concentration, by trying to introduce something else now. So I'm going to cut our lecture. What, what it means is today I'm going to cut our lecture short. What I was saying is today we want to discuss quite a lot of, quite a lot of interesting uh, concepts. We are wrapping up our discussion on discounted cash flow techniques, particularly uh, we are escalating from where we left. Remember last time we left on, on modified IRR, value at risk and, and NPV computations and stuff. And I gave your colleagues a task and I said, can you play the first video and be in a position to calculate value at risk. So as we are playing these two videos, the first two videos, clearly you, you, you actually catch up with your colleagues on where we are now. So what we want to discuss now is profitability index, uh, you know, that issue of capital rationing and we kept it up and then we discuss something to do with option pricing, the basic definitions involved in option pricing. That's what we want to discuss. So let us wrap up discounted cash flow techniques and introduce each ourselves to option pricing. Okay, so allow me as usual to open to open my uh, my Excel document here. 
let me open my Excel document. All right. Um, I have I've sent to you all the materials that I have given your colleagues thus far. So I'm sure you have you have everything with you. Um, yeah, I just want to open my revision kit, which is BPP revision kit. You know, that's the revision kit that I like most. BPP kit. Though I, I equally like Kaplan, but you know, 